Windows 3.0 is quickly emerging as the standard user interface for the PC. And while Microsoft and Apple may be arguing in court over who owns the rights to the graphical user interface, or GUI, it's generally acknowledged that it really all began here at Xerox Park, where back in the 1970s they started working with concepts like icons, windows, and WYSIWYG. Indeed, Xerox may be finally getting its revenge as it comes out with its own network GUI product for desktop PCs called Global View. Today, we'll take a look at the graphical user interface, Windows 3.0 in particular, on this edition of the Computer Chronicles. The Computer Chronicles is made possible in part by the Software Publishers Association, which reminds you that software piracy is a federal offense. When a few people steal software, everyone loses. Additional funding is provided by PC Connection and Mac Connection, and by Byte Magazine and Bix, the Byte Information Exchange. Welcome to the Computer Chronicles. I'm Stuart Chaffe, and this is Gary Kildall. Gary, I thought this was a show about Windows. What, <laughs> what, that's not Windows. What do I see up here? Well, Stuart, this is a digital research uh, DR DOS, uh -huh. and this is the front end for it. It's called ViewMax, uh -huh. and it's a, a graphical interface, as you can see. It replaces basically the C greater than prompt. Yeah, I, <laughs> that I remember that. Okay. Now, basically, there's drop-down menus, uh, and of course, you select it with the mouse, and you have things like the calculator that mm -hmm. you'd expect. Uh, and on the screen, you can uh, resize and move around. And so we'll pull up a calculator and a clock, for example. And uh, then we can also go in here and access, say, the C drive by double clicking on that. We'll see the icons come up for the, uh, um, mm -hmm. the various folders that are subdirectories in your, in your uh, C drive in this case. Now let's say we want to take a look at something like, uh, well, let's take a look at autoexec.bat. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we select it and then show the contents. And what you'd expect mm -hmm. is an ASCII file. And we use a standard close uh, box there. And let's say if we access something like command.com, which is a machine code file, right. then of course, we take a look at that, and we'll just what we expect, we would see the machine yeah. code for it. And you have a slider bar here that you can reposition and take a look and, and see various parts of, not very interesting, but <laughs> it shows you the, uh, the idea there. Uh -huh. And we'll close this out. Now, if you want to run a program, now let's, let's say, for example, we'll bring the calculator back up here. And let's say you want to run, uh, say, Prodigy. Okay. okay, so I'll double click on that and uh, bring that up to the uh, top here with the mm -hmm. command line, and we'll say okay, and uh, we'll not save the desktop, mm -hmm. and we'll, we're there into Prodigy. Uh -huh. Okay, so of course we exit then Prodigy, right. and we would be back into ViewMax again. I guess the point here is, Gary, that this is not just about Windows. I mean, the graphic user interface, whether it's it's ViewMax or the others, have, have really taken over. Yeah. And mm -hmm. uh, I see an analogy here. It's like the Cold War capitalism has defeated communism <laughs> for good. It seems like in the war of interfaces, it's clear the graphic interface has defeated the old command line the exactly. text right. interface. Why? Why is the war over? Well, why, there, why'd they win? Yeah, there's a, there are a couple reasons, but the, the most important one is that we can now assume that uh, really anybody that has an IBM computer system has something like VGA uh -huh. at, as, a, as a graphical a display device. Now, we couldn't assume that a few years ago. Mm -hmm. The worst case is a monochrome uh, MDA, a monochrome right, display. Right. And, uh, of course, with that, we can only use text. Yeah. And we don't, we don't have the capability of using graphical interfaces. But nowadays, we expect graphics. We can have it on the, as a front end for the operating system, mm -hmm. get away from the old command lines, and right. we expect all programs that are really uh, uh, up to date are going to have yeah. graphical yeah. interfaces yeah. on them. Okay, today we'll take a look at the product that is leading the way toward this new world order in computing, Windows 3.0. We'll also get to see the new Windows Development System Toolbook from Asymmetrics, and we'll find out about a new Windows-like interface that runs on an XT with only 512K of memory. First of all, there is a little legal matter to dispose of. Apple is suing Microsoft, claiming that it stole the graphic and icon interface idea from the Macintosh. Monica Jane reports on the status of the lawsuit. While Microsoft is basking in rave reviews of Windows 3.0, it's also battling with Apple over ownership of the Graphical User Interface, or GUI. The case is being fought at the San Francisco Federal Courthouse. In it, Apple claims it licensed the Mac GUI to Microsoft only for the original version of Windows 1.0. Apple claims the second version of Windows infringed on that agreement in over 180 ways. After two years of wrangling, those claims have now been whittled down to ten. Unresolved issues include the concept of moving an icon anywhere on the screen, having windows overlap, and being able to move a window on and off the screen. These concerns are legitimate. The issue is whether they're copyrightable concerns. 
Apple believes that these features are something distinctive of the Apple Macintosh and that they are unique, exp unique and original expressions of an idea embodied in the Apple Macintosh. The idea of protecting the look and feel of a product has spawned similar cases in Silicon Valley. Apple has also sued Hewlett Packard and Lotus recently won a major battle when a judge ruled that paperback software infringed on Lotus 123. But Roche says the flurry of lawsuits will have a positive effect on the computer industry. I think it encourages people to think originally and from that standpoint it may actually help us to have more and better and, and truly innovative software. It will encourage people to do something new and something creative rather than rewarding them for doing simple copying. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Monica Jane. It's time to take a look at Windows 3.0, and to do that we have with us the Windows Systems Engineer for Microsoft, Margaret Johnson. And also we're going to find out why Windows seems to be such a hit. We have with us Gus Vendito, Executive Editor of PC Magazine. Gary? Yes, uh, Windows 1 Windows 2 has had some problems in terms of acceptance. Uh, uh, have some of those problems been solved in Windows 3, and just what's going on with it? Well, the, the acceptance has definitely increased with Windows 3. Uh, right now, Windows is really hot. It's the top selling program for PCs is when it was released in May it went to the top of the charts and it stayed there so the uh, problems with Windows 1 and 2 were more a matter of uh, perfecting it and right now uh, people seem to love Windows 3. Okay now Margaret you uh, obviously know a lot about Windows 3 can you tell us a little bit about it? Sure I'd like to do that by giving a little visual display on the monitor um, there's been a lot of enhancements both visually and technically to Windows 3 that includes proportional fonts um, in both the menuing and in the dialog boxes and the use of 3D buttons. The other nice thing that people are, are really excited about is we got away with the MS-DOS executive and replaced it with the three applications, the program manager for the logical grouping of applications. Mm -hmm. We also have the file manager down here so that we can directly manipulate files. And then the third is the task list to go between the tasks. The other um, great feature is in the setup. Before we had a Windows 286 and a Windows 386. That caused a lot of um, confusion. Now we have one version. You pop um, disk one into your A drive. You type in setup. The um, it, setup con determines your configuration, goes into a Windows application. Now, you can, once you go into Windows, you have this Windows application in which you can then reinstall drivers. Say, for example, you change your video display. You can pick a new video display. The next time you go into Windows, it's all set for you. Now, in terms of uh, development tools, what, what is uh, provided with Windows 3 for somebody who wants to write an application, say, under Windows? With uh, Windows 3, you need to get the software developer's kit, the SDK for Windows 3, and that includes actually, well, this isn't my machine. <laughs> actually, there are a lot of tools like a dialog editor, an icon editor. Um, we assume Microsoft C6 uh, compilers, but there's a lot of 4GLs like Asymmetrics Toolbook, which are very mm -hmm. powerful which development environments mm -hmm. yeah. um, to, to get into. Um, getting back to the program manager, which is installed when, when you install Windows, you actually get three groups installed for you. An important group, um, these three groups are the main accessory and the games group. Mm -hmm. And the main is for system configuration to give you an idea of how you would use it. You can co totally customize your desktop. Let's say, for example, we want to change the color. We can do it from de default colors, and, or we could get very bold and, and just... Um, Mess it up on your own. Yeah, yeah. really. <laughs> and considering that my, my lack of color taste is, is quite strong, I'll, 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 I'll do one that I, I feel yeah. safe with, the ocean. I don't want to get anybody sick. And you can customize the desktop not, even, not just with colors, but also with um, background bitmaps. Say you have a company logo. Well, we're in San Francisco, so I'm a big Niner fan, so I'll put back my Niner logo for the, for the game tomorrow. And, and you're going to work against that background. Yeah. <laughs> So all Sunday, I can just keep <laughs> saying, you know, go Joe. Okay. Do the okay, big one. Margaret, also, um, what are the system requirements? What do you assume as far as graphics device, for example? Uh, good question. Right now, Windows is, has three modes. We have the real mode, the standard mode, and the enhanced mode. In setup, it's determined what type um, from your machine requirements you would have. The real mode is for downward compatibility with 2.x. It will run applications that aren't Windows 3 ready. It is also for machines with less than one megabytes of memory. 
Mm -hmm. um, the standard mode runs uses the protected environment of the two and three eighty six with for one megabyte and greater machines. And the enhanced mode, the 386 enhanced mode, will use the virtual memory management of the 386 to virtualize the memory for more memory. And also for the standard DOS applications yeah. can run in the virtual 86 mode. So when you're talking about Windows 3 as uh, the executive in this case, you're not really running uh, MS-DOS underneath it then, huh? I mean, it runs as a as a special in a special area as a special right, task exactly. rather than being the executive. Right, we're trying mm -hmm. to make it more logical as you use your desktop with Windows 3. Margaret, briefly, I want you to show me the dynamic data exchange feature of this. Um, that's a good point. Windows, a very powerful feature of Windows 3 that we want to get across is the <coughs> interprocess communications. You saw it first with cut, copy, and paste. It's followed with Windows in the Windows environment with the dynamic data exchange or DDE. In 2.x. You could use it, but it wasn't all that easy, and you couldn't use a lot of data. Now with Windows 3 memory restrictions going away, you can connect the dots between the applications right, with show, dynamic show data. Okay, so if I change the number of Joes, the next month he has uh, 10,000 units. All documents associated with that will automatically be updated. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, you can see this change, yeah. be, being the start of an, a powerful executive information system. Sure. Gus, I want to turn to you for a second. What do you see developer support for Windows 3.0? Is that changing too in terms of the, you said user acceptance has changed? Right? Yeah, there have been a lot of companies been working on Windows in the last year. Windows has become a great forum for small companies to uh, get a, a, a leg in the market. What has been a source of controversy is that some of the large software publishers, software publishing Lotus, mm -hmm. they were waiting for OS 2. Yeah. And they're, they've been passing up Windows, but I think they're going to take a second look and they're uh, kind of stepping back and getting their programmers uh, doing Windows programming instead of the OS2 programming that had been the top priority. Do you see uh, uh, there are quite a few applications then coming up under Windows at this point? And there have been a flood of them coming out, mm -hmm. and that's partly why it's been so successful because uh, in the earlier versions of Windows, there was nothing really to run under Windows. It took a long time. PageMaker came out. Now with uh, the, the uh, Windows 3.0, everybody's upgraded, everybody is coming out with a lot of new utilities. Um, programs that were running under different platforms are coming to Windows, Ventura Publisher is coming to Windows, and uh, next year we'll have WordPerfect and Lotus 1.2.3, and that's going to really solidify mm -hmm. it as being a major, uh, it, it's really the center of the PC right now. All right, Gus, Margaret, thank you very much. Well, there is one problem with Windows. You do need at least a 286 machine and 640K of RAM, though a 386 and 2 megs is the ideal. GeoWorks, though, in Berkeley has come up with an alternative that can run on your old PC XT, Hercules card and all. Monica Jane reports. For a small business like Inquiry Incorporated, a new environment called Geos offers the power of Microsoft Windows without requiring expensive or upgraded hardware. GS from GeoWorks in Berkeley sits on top of DOS, but also has its own operating system. It's also got many of the same features as Windows, a graphic interface with colorful icons, multitasking, and multi-threading capabilities enabling users to cut and paste between different applications. But one of the most attractive features of GEOS is that it can run in just 512K of RAM, and that means Windows-like power for owners of low-end machines. Inquiry develops information systems for large corporate clients, and it's a beta tester for Geos. The company's owner, Hilde de Frisco, says she's pleased with the performance of the test results. What Geos is going to be able to do for us, I think, is that when we bring on our next employee, we can buy them a low-end machine, a dot matrix printer, and set them up with the Geos package. And that will be a big cost savings to us. You know, I really see that as a big value. Geos is already bundled with several software applications for small businesses. That includes an electronic Rolodex which keeps track of thousands of names and numbers and lets the user dial out with a click of the mouse. DeFrisco says the biggest advantage with Geos is the high quality of its printing. Because it has outlined font technology, users can get near laser printer quality with a dot matrix printer. People from GeoWorks say their product is designed for a broad range of users. Where Windows is really targeting a corporate market, we're targeting a mass market that includes small businesses, home offices, and home productivity users. In addition to which, our product, we put more productivity applications that have a lot of meat to them. We put a lot more functionality in the base package than Windows, which really is requiring you to go out and buy additional four uh, to $500 applications on which uh, to put Windows. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Monica Jane.
So you don't necessarily need a Macintosh to get a nice, friendly graphics interface, but a Mac does come bundled with HyperCard. Well, Windows 3.0 comes bundled with something called Toolbook. And here to tell us about it is Glenn Morrissey of Asymmetrics. Also with us here from Microsoft is Kathy Harris, who's going to show us a desktop presentation graphics program that uses Windows. Gary? Glenn, it's obvious that the acceptance of any kind of a user interface is really dependent on how many, how many uh, application programs are out there. Mm -hmm. uh, when we were talking to Margaret earlier, she mentioned uh, Toolbook as one of those uh, construction sets for programmers. Tell us a little bit about the approach that Toolbook takes. Well, Toolbook is a software construction set for the Windows platform. And we like to say that it's as easy as using a draw package to create a Windows 3 application. Now, when you're talking about creating an application, are you talking mm -hmm. about the front end of the application, or are you talking about generating a machine, or a, a, say, source code for the, the application? Well, we're, what Toolbook is, is uh, a blank sheet when you first open it up. And what you can generate is a front end to a database. You can generate its own application. We come with flat file database capabilities. You can create your own full feature database with Toolbook. So it can be used as front ends. But it's for still a case that a programmer goes in there and, and fills out the code, right? That's right. We have our own scripting language called OpenScript. Okay. I can draw a piece of the program. This is a button that you could use for navigation. I can give this button a uh, script, and that is a program in, in Toolbook. Now, I could draw the entire application. That would take quite a few minutes, and I, we don't have mm -hmm. the time right now. Let me show you what I've done to give you a quick overview of running a uh, Toolbook application, how you would create such, as, uh, such a thing as a, a front end to what I'm going to do here is I'm going to import some ASCII text. Okay. Um, this is uh, being imported into Toolbook. Toolbook is automatically creating record fields, which are database fields. Here they are in the default format here. And what I will do is pull out some clip art and some intelligent objects. These objects have scripts and they have been pre-created to uh, aid in this demonstration. I will paste them onto the background here. And here we have the objects. What I have here is the layout page. That's a button that I have pre-scripted to lay out what I would do in maybe about an hour and a half. I'll click the button, and Toolbook will perform these activities. It's, it's laying out the background colors, the size, uh, shape of fields, angled lines, buttons for navigation in the upper right corner, shadowing the text. And here I have just finished the creation of a front end to a database. Mm -hmm. This could be used as both a front end and as its own flat file database. Here's one page, and I can show you that all the information in this page, here's Jonathan Morton, it all flowed to where those objects were placed. Okay. Now, uh, would you, now going back to the original question, uh, mm -hmm. would you expect that an application programmer could do the complete application in the scripting language, or would you have to drop into C or what? Well, you can do both. The beauty about Toolbook is it takes full advantage of the Windows 3 platform. DDE, DLLs, which are dynamic link libraries, you can, if you'd like, extend Toolbook by writing uh, routines that aren't in Toolbook, but you, that you'd like to have as part of your application. Yeah, okay. Now, Glenn, you have an application that you're going to show us here, right? Mm -hmm. Here's Daybook. This is one of the applications. This application is bundled mm -hmm. with uh, the runtime version of Toolbook with every version of uh, retail version of Win3. And this is a personal information manager. It's very graphical. It was created entirely in Toolbook. Um, Toolbook also comes with uh, sample applications such as sample scripts so that people can start creating uh, applications straight out of the box without having to learn the programming language. Now, have you had uh, any application programmers that actually come to market with products using... Um we have several. Um, mainly what we're uh, seeing right now is that corporations are picking the product up very fast. Um, we also have a lot of ISVs, independent so software vendors, that, that are creating applications um, one is the Heiser Group. They've created a, a uh, Convert-It program, which mm -hmm. converts HyperStack, uh, HyperCard yeah. stacks into Toolbook applications. Mm -hmm. All right, Kathy, I want to turn to you. We see one thing that we used to sort of only do on the Mac, and now mm -hmm. we do in the Windows environment. You have another, which is really a program, PowerPoint. Yes, with the introduction of Windows 3, Microsoft took the um, PowerPoint program that we had running on the Macintosh and brought it to the Windows 3 platform. What you're seeing here on the screen well, is... Be, 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 before you get to the link, are there differences? Is it the identical program? Does it work differently under Windows? The programs work very, very similarly. 
Um, the keystrokes are, are all the same. The only difference between the Windows product and the Macintosh product is that the Windows product, we've now added um, charting and outlining capabilities to the product. Uh -huh, which you didn't have before. Which we didn't have yeah. in the Macintosh product. The products also, um, we have a file translation capability so that people who are working in dual platform environments can share uh -huh, files uh -huh. back and forth. And absolutely everything that was brought into the presentation translates regardless of where mm -hmm. it was created. Okay, so now show us what it looks like under Windows. All right. The first thing you notice about PowerPoint when you open up a file is that a file is your entire presentation. And that means that, now for instance, this is a black and white overhead presentation that I've put together. I can click through several slides and they're all in one file. My entire presentation uh -huh, uh -huh. is in one yeah. file. And that means that I can view my entire presentation by either the titles, in the title sorter where I can drag and move slides around, or I can go to the slide sorter and look at my slides visually and see them there. And again, I can move slides around very quickly and very easily. Now another thing that you can do that's easy to do in this mode is be able to copy and paste slides between presentations. Mm -hmm. This is a product that's um, designed for business people. And what we find in business is that they share um, presentations a lot. You've maybe made some overheads that I want to use in my presentation. So let's open up that file here. And let's take these color overheads that we presented and just drag across them to select them. Go to the edit menu, do a copy, and go to our other window here and select an insertion point where we want those to show up. And just go to the edit menu and do a paste and they'll come right in. And you notice when these slides come in, they're taking on the look and feel of the new presentation. If we pull up the old presentation here, you can sort of compare the way they look. They have a, old, a different format here mm -hmm. and they have a new format here. Well, that's because of something called the Slide Master. Every presentation has one master slide where we control all the elements of the presentation. So if you want to customize a presentation sure, yeah. for a particular audience, say you're, you're giving a standard presentation that you usually give, you can just um, make a change in one place. Let's just drag this logo and go back to your slides. And you'll see that that change has been made in every slide in your presentation yeah. just that quickly. Kathy, l let me ask you, I mean, there are other desktop presentation graphics that run on the PC before Windows and didn't need Windows. What was it about Windows that made, made it possible for you, made you decide to move this PowerPoint over to Well, the PC whole graphical platform? approach to um, PowerPoint is really unique now among, um, among the PC presentation products. Those projects products, excuse me, yeah. don't allow you to directly manipulate things on the, on the screen and see what you're getting. Um, because of the graphical user interface of Windows, now people can really control what they're doing better and they don't have this form, uh, you know, fill in the form and then see yeah, what you get yeah. approach. Also, um, we have this multiple, um, multiple images per file, which allows you to have the slide master capabilities and be able to um, see your whole presentation mm -hmm, as opposed mm -hmm. to file per file basis. All right, Kathy, that's, we're out of time. I'm sorry, I know you want to tell us more and more about PowerPoint, but uh, we've had it. So, Kathy Glenn, thank you very much. That is our look at Windows 3.0, and we'll be back in just a minute with this week's computer news. In the random access file this week, Xerox has announced a new PC desktop operating environment called Global View. This is the first time the famed Xerox Park Group has introduced a product for the PC platform. Global View is a combination hardware and software product designed for PC networks. It uses an icon-based graphical interface. An old name in typewriters wants to become a new name in personal computers. Smith Corona has announced plans to introduce a line of PCs aimed at the home and small business market. The new machines will be developed jointly with the Acer Corporation and will be marketed under a new Smith Corona Acer brand name. Apple has announced that the full version of HyperCard 2.0 will be bundled with all new Macs. However, the scripting or programming mode of HyperCard 2 will have to be turned on by the user by removing an opaque button over the scripting choices on the home stack. Apple says the protection scheme will prevent totally new users from destroying or altering stacks unintentionally. NEC is preparing to release a new palm top computer. The system will measure 7 inches by 10 inches and weigh in at under 5 pounds. It will be MS-DOS compatible and come bundled with software, the price under $1,500. Now with this week's software, or in this case, hardware review, here's Paul Schindler. What's missing from this picture? Controls. Those clever folks at Hewlett Packard have done it again. They've created the niftiest printer we've seen yet for the Macintosh, the HP Desk Writer. The Desk Writer is an HP DeskJet Plus modified to work with Apple Macintosh computers. 
It has a chooser level interface, a lovely piece of techno gibberish which means you don't need to go to third parties for software to attach this printer to your Macintosh. It's Hewlett Packard's software that makes this hardware solution elegant. The HP desk writer is just as easy to use as a laser writer, and the output looks just as good to the average person. And it's much better than image writer dot matrix printer output. Here is image writer draft mode and desk writer draft mode. Desk writer software also does font sizing up to 127 point. Here's what that looks like on paper. It comes with four fonts. If you really want it to sing, get the add-on pack of another six fonts for $400. The desk writer is simple but expensive. Since it's an utterly great printer, it's worth the $1,200 that HP wants for it. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Paul Schindler. Taking a look at this week's top 10 software titles for the PC, according to PC Connection, Windows 3.0 still in the number one slot, followed by Expanded Memory Manager 5.0 and Central Point's PC Tools Deluxe 6.0. In fourth place is WordPerfect 5.1, followed by the new Norton Utilities. Rounding out the top 10 are Procom Plus, Excel 2.1, PC File 5.0, InfoSelect, and CorelDRAW. Plus Development has announced what it calls the world's fastest 3.5-inch PC hard drive. The HardCard 2 XL50 and the HardCard 2 XL105 are hard drives on a card. The performance improvement is achieved through sustained transfer rates of as high as 1.4 megabytes per second. Well, if your next hotel doesn't have a data jack on the phone, two companies have come up with a solution for you. Using new variations on old technology, Com1 Data Communications is selling a package called LaVoyager that includes an acoustic coupler, a tiny battery-powered 2400 baud modem, and all necessary cables. And Information Machines has recently redesigned their acoustic coupler to also handle 2400 baud transmission rates. It works with your internal or external modem and costs less than $200. Well, finally, why does the FBI belong to more than 25 bulletin boards used by specific political organizations? That's what the Computer Professionals Group for Social Responsibility wants to know. CPSR has filed a suit for release of information on whether the FBI operates a clandestine computer bulletin board system and routinely monitors other boards. Think about that the next time you sign on. That's it for this week's Computer Chronicles. I'm Maria Gabriel. The Computer Chronicles is made possible in part by the Software Publishers Association, which reminds you that software piracy is a federal offense. When a few people steal software, everyone loses. Additional funding is provided by PC Connection and Mac Connection, and by Byte Magazine and Bix, the Byte Information Exchange. For a transcript of this week's Computer Chronicles, send $4 to PTV Publications, Post Office Box 701, Kent, Ohio, 44240. Please indicate program date.